So good evening. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome and introduce Rodi Kalia, uh, who is uh, going to speak to us today. I want to start by thanking the South Asia Initiative, uh, Nina Hewitt and Nora. Nina is the Associate Director of the South Asia Initiative, and they have very kindly supported this uh, series of seminars or lectures on uh, urbanization in South Asia as one of the many programs they run. Uh, their, next, uh, uh, their next event is actually on the 23rd uh, of, uh, uh, of this month, uh, which is uh, their South Asia Without Borders series, like the urbanization series, that's one of their series. And this one is on faith, loyalty, status, the Mughal era perspectives on the elite Rajput conversions to Islam. And their next, I mean, there are many other events in the meanwhile, but their next uh, urbanization uh, event here at the GSD is on the 18th of April, uh, and we're going to have Janice Perlman, who's the founder of the Mega Cities Project, uh, speak to us. Uh, but now I'd like to focus on introducing Ravi, who I consider a really important scholar. Ravi's work uh, has, uh, I think, interestingly and very importantly, uh, when a lot of discussions about urbanization in India in the last few decades have focused on mega cities, uh, have focused on Mumbai and Kolkata, and a lot of the, the writings within the social sciences, anthropology, etc., focused on these places. Uh, Ravi sort of uh, began to look at uh, the capital towns, uh, both because they were important as capital cities that were being built, Chandigarh, Bhubaneswar, and Gandhinagar in Gujarat, uh, but also uh, he sort of shifted uh, the discussion to uh, cities that were being created afresh uh, with new possibilities uh, and also cities that were of a different size which uh, opens up a discussion about medium-sized cities for or towns for India which is important and not enough of that has happened. So I think his work is seminal because it sort of shifted the gaze uh, on both these uh, counts. Uh, but most, more importantly, his, uh, uh, his courses uh, uh, where he you know, teaches uh, as well as uh, his uh, interests and writings uh, have spanned all the way from architectural history, urban studies, popular culture, cinema, subaltern studies. And very recently he edited an anthology, a very significant one, uh, which is titled Pakistan from the Rhetoric of Democracy to the Rise of Militancy. Uh, and um, he did the lead essay for this uh, anthology, which was incredibly well received in India, and there was a lot of discussion in the press around this rather potent issue uh, and, and, and around Pakistan and the discussion about the politics and the contestations that we are witnessing um, in, in the landscape of, of, of the nation of Pakistan. Uh, uh, Ravi Kalia specializes in South Asian studies and particularly urban architectural history in colonial and post-colonial India. Uh, the books that he's edited uh, on the cities I just described uh, one is titled Chandigarh, The Making of an Indian City, which was 87, revised in 1999. Bhubaneswar, uh, which is another city in Orissa, from a temple town to a capital city, 1994. And Gandhinagar, which is the capital of Gujarat, uh, building national identity in post-colonial India, 2004 and 2005. Uh, and uh, imagining India in the 20th century, an architectural view which is sort of forthcoming. He's working on this. Uh, uh, which should be out in the next year, we don't know, but soon. Uh, he's also written extensively in the India Quarterly, Journal of Urban History, Journal of Technology and Science, and many other uh, peer-reviewed uh, and popular uh, sort of journals around these questions of urbanization. Uh, and so it gives me great pleasure to welcome him here, and with that I'm going to hand it over to Ravi Kalia. Thank you. I guess I'm why I'm Thank you, Raul. Uh, am I doing something wrong? No. Okay. Am I okay? Yeah. Okay. I need that reassurance. Uh, Ra thanks, Raul. Um, Raul and I go back a long time when we both had a full head of hair. Uh, and so you can imagine how long ago was that. Uh, and Raul has been a, a, a 
not only a good friend, uh, but also an inspiration in many ways. Uh, and it is uh, true, uh, the accusation that is made against him, that he's one of the very few sensitive architects in, in, in modern India, and I am very happy to endorse that view. His work uh, has been very impressive and uh, very well received, not only in India, but as a matter of fact, viewed around the world. And so um, I'm very happy that he invited me here. And in fact, he had invited me last time when uh, he and Charles Courier were engaged in the exercise of doing Navi Bombay, or New Bombay. Uh, that was uh, almost a decade ago, a little more than a decade ago. And, and that was in Bombay. Uh, in some sense, uh, uh, in some sense, uh, there is, uh, uh, I think we can have the first slide. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, I sort of invented this, uh, which is a little distortion of a saying from a, a Persian saying, if you live long enough, uh, you recapture the past. And, and in some sense, coming to Harvard is recapturing the past, although I was not a student here. Uh, but I have ties to uh, Harvard, which go back when I was uh, barely 13 years old. Uh, and that, what I say that, and that's John Kenneth Galbraith. Uh, uh, I think uh, at the age of 13, I had uh, taken the plunge of participating in what was called the Shankar's weekly children's competition. Uh, Shankar, uh, Gutta Million Brahmin, uh, popularly known as uh, Shankar, started a, ma a magazine uh, by the name of uh, Shankar. Uh, and, uh, or Shankar Weekly, as, as it were, in 1948, and uh, worked very uh, much with the children, wrote children books. Uh, he was a cartoonist, as a matter of fact. And he didn't even spare Nehru, as you can see very much uh, in that uh, side uh, picture that you have on the screen. Uh, and he started uh, what was called the Shankar's Weekly Competition, um, which was an international competition for children. And uh, in the first uh, uh, attempt that I participated in, in, in that uh, competition, I was fortunate enough to win the first prize, uh, which was then given to me by John Kenneth Galbraith. Uh, it was uh, a kind of a serial experience. Many decades later, when I was uh, working in North Carolina, I wrote to him, inviting him, knowing his fondness for golf, and he wrote me back saying that you are living in a very good part, a very beautiful part of the country. However, because of the political reasons and the thinking on that side, uh, I don't think I'm going to travel to North Carolina. A clear reference to Jesse Helms. Uh, so, uh, and I fully appreciated uh, the position that he had taken on that. Uh, much later, uh, when I entered uh, Delhi University uh, in the late 60s, Amritya Sen had just returned after finishing his tripos at Cambridge, and he was teaching at the Delhi School of Economics, which is a red building out there. Uh, and uh, so the buzz was on the campus, this really hotshot young economist had showed up uh, at Delhi University, so we wanted to know a little more about what he was doing, uh, nosy as teenagers are, so we would uh, break into his class, and he was always gracious enough to let us sit there and not throw us out. So uh, unfortunately, I did write to him, but because of earlier commitments, he was not able to get here. Much of what I have to say really revolves around two ideas, uh, which is to say, how do ideas germinate? and how our visions framed. Uh, and uh, the entire story, I mean, though that is the running theme uh, in what I have to say today. Uh, in, and if you fuse the two together, it would be how ideas are framed or how ideas germinate to frame visions, if you will. Uh, and that is really uh, the interplay of those two concepts uh, that basically defines today's talk and in many ways also defines my work uh, essentially uh, on uh, the three cities that I worked on and, and, and the forthcoming book also uh, pretty much addresses that uh, theme which is continuous in my work and also in some sense filters into my work on Pakistan. 
Uh, you might know, those of you who are tuned into the India scene and, and keep up with the news, uh, five wise men, uh, which includes my good friend Ram Gua, uh, who is presently at London School of Economics, just issued a verdict uh, saying that India is foolish to aspire to the status of a superpower. Uh, and he has, they have given seven very compelling reasons, uh, two of which is because of the economic divide that has widened between the rich and the poor, uh, and of course the other is the coalition government uh, politics which has entered into the uh, polity of India, which uh, clearly has uh, interfered with many things uh, that uh, government should be doing but is unable to do because of the uh, competing or conflicting interest of the coalition partners. So, uh, <coughs> uh, in many ways what Gua is saying is what I basically argued uh, in relationship to the urban scene in India and he has leveraged that essentially to uh, apply that to the geopolitical scene. So in many ways that is what the idea is, that you can find an idea any place and you can have its application in a completely different field. Uh, and in that sense, I think that also uh, tunes into it. Chandigarh, of course, has been called uh, by Bill Curtis and many others uh, as the beginning of the urban Indian experience, if you will, and especially modernism, uh, which came with the arrival of Le Corbusier. And there is a little bit of a dichotomy in that, uh, because uh, Corbu, of course, came on the scene, uh, and the city has come to be emblematic of Kurbu's work in India, but much of what he did is really limited to the capital complex. The master plan had already been done by Albert Meyer uh, in New York, uh, New Yorker actually, uh, and, uh, and even some of the drawings had been done by Matthew Nubiki, some of which you, might, you will see today, uh, but they were not implemented for any number of reasons and you know, the pressure of time is going to <laughs> prevent me from getting into the detail. But some of these things, I'm, I hope, will get thrashed out in the question and answer session when we, when we, when we get out there. Uh, the driver for Indian urbanism uh, really is uh, the partition and the influx of refugees, over six million refugees that poured into India, essentially in Western India, although uh, there were uh, migrations from East Pakistan into Bengal as well. But the scale of those was relatively small. So really the problem was uh, in the Punjab in particular, uh, also because Punjab had lost its historic capital, Lahore, uh, to Pakistan as a consequence of the partition. And so the question became whether they should upgrade an existing city to the level of a capital and then add some other bells and whistles to it to make it uh, more modernized uh, and wide enough to cope with the governmental functions uh, or build something new. So in other words, it was not only the refugees, people who were refugees, but the government itself was a refugee. Uh, Punjab government was functioning out of about 12 cities in Punjab. Uh, so the offices were scattered all over the, all over the state, which made it very tedious to run the government, so they really needed to build the capital. So there was uh, very good reasons for it. Uh, it is another story that uh, 10 years or 15 years later, in 1966, uh, Punjab itself will go through a second partition when the new state of Haryana was created based on linguistic grounds as a consequence of the reorganization of uh, states that followed uh, first with Andhra and then subsequently in other uh, parts of the country as well. So as you can see, uh, it was a brutal experience, and these are some of the pictures which illustrate that, that people poured into India on bullock carts, on, on top of the trains, uh, walking, uh, any which way they could get to India. They get, and of course, the migration from India to Pakistan was equally heart-rendering, uh, which is not, I must recognize that so that one understand uh, the larger dynamics uh, of, uh, of the partition. Uh, so the first uh, people on the scene uh, were to address the issue of the new capital were uh, Albert Meyer uh, you know, and, uh, and Matthew Nowicki. Uh, Nowicki, uh, of course, uh, uh, was born in Poland, um, had apprenticed with uh, Corbu in Paris uh, before he ended up in the United States. He was teaching 
at uh, North Carolina State University in Raleigh uh, and was known to, uh, uh, to Albert. Uh, and so Meyer recruited him to do the renditions of the drawing. He was going to be the architect and Meyer was going to be the planner. Meyer was already in India at the time when the question arose. He had been there during World War II building, uh, uh, building airstrips essentially in Bengal uh, with the invasion of Japan uh, and coming into Burma, they were knocking on, on the doors of India and of course that was very frightening to the British and of course the American troops had also been poured in, into India to prevent any further uh, expansion of Japanese influence. So Meyer uh, was there addressing those issues and was known to Nehru at the time and so uh, he started the project basically. But then Matthew Nowicki died in 1950 on his flight back, uh, oh sorry, on his flight from India uh, to the United States in 1950. Apparently he was flying TWA, as the story goes, and the plane crashed somewhere in Egypt. Uh, and so once Matthew was removed uh, from the scene, uh, Meyer was left without an architect. And there were also hassles about the foreign exchange. India, of course, was very uh, tight on foreign exchange, and Nehru was very concerned about uh, entering into agreements with foreign architects uh, with their mega fees, which India could not meet. Uh, and so that was basically uh, the end of the Meyer scene. Uh, you see <coughs> super block housing type A, uh, one of the renditions uh, you know, that uh, Meyer did. And the argument is that, well, of course, you know, there is a certain historicism here uh, fueled by certain romanticism. Uh, that had Meyer lived, uh, Chandigarh would have been much more of an Indian city than it turned out to be. Well, uh, my answer to that is that if, Ap if Adam had not taken the bite of the apple, the world would have looked very different. Uh, so, you know, I mean, those are pure speculations that we engage in. And, and, and it is very possible that had Meyer proceeded with his project, uh, that he himself may have ended up redefining uh, his work. But clearly he was one person who was very sensitive. Now therein lies the crux of the planning thinking in India that existed then and exists even today. It is not as irrelevant as, as, as today as, as it was then because the debate has always been around doing something which is Indian. And that fits the Indian cultural milieu. Uh, that is, in this globalized world, and especially when India has aspirations of becoming a superpower, that's a contradiction in terms. One can make that argument. Okay. Uh, but nevertheless, it is a thinking that persists. So uh, when Kuru came to India, uh, he did a sketch, and this is his first sketch. Uh, actually, he had told the Indians when they met him in France, in Paris, at his studio, I can do this job sitting right here. I don't have to go to India. I know India. I've read about India. I don't have to go there. But they said, no, 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 you have to go to India. You know, this is, it's not going to work this way. Uh, so. This is his first drawing, and if you, uh, as you will notice, uh, you know, he has put the capital complex as the thinking part of the uh, master plan at the top, at the head, right behind with Shivali Hills at the background. And what he basically was saying here is that India is a peasant civilization. For thousands of years, it has built some great temples and Hindu temples and great mosques. But what India has not done is to build and create modern civilization, architecture for modern civilization, offices, factories, buildings, and so on. You know, this was his basically sales pitch. This was markedly different from what Meyer and Matthew Nubiki were trying oh. To sell to the Indian government. They were, by using the Dadbun plan as their model, uh, 
with the neighborhood unit as uh, the centerpiece of it and stringing series of uh, uh, those units into a city fabric, uh, what they were basically arguing was that India is a village society and those units, urban units, reflect that villageness. And so multiple villages fits very well with the Indian milieu. And that idea actually was quite persuasive, you know, and that people will find living in those neighborhoods uh, very culturally very comfortable and, 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 and will be, they will be far more responsive. Now, Kurbu basically rejected that argument. He, and this is one of the remarkable things about the Chandigarh story and the stories after that, is that what is your sales pitch? You know, and Kurbu's sales pitch was completely different. He was basically saying is that, look, you guys have missed out on the first industrial revolution because you were under colonial rule. The British were not interested in promoting uh, uh, a industrialized society, which is true. India, uh, British had done a spectacular job in introducing educational system as they did in the late 1930s and then setting up the universities after the Great Mutiny in 1958, uh, sorry, 1858 and so on. But they were basically designed to turn out bureaucrats, you know, specialists in humanities and lawyers and so on and so forth. At the time of independence, there were only 200 qualified architects in India. This is in spite of the fact that at the beginning of the century, the British had undertaken one of the most mega projects in urban planning, the building of New Delhi. So most of the Indians had simply served as draftsmen. None of them had really been involved in the planning per se. And the number of uh, uh, engineers was not any larger. So this was clearly starting from scratch, if you will. And so what Kurbu was basically saying is that you missed out on the first industrial revolution. And now what you need to do is to catch up on that and get prepared for the second industrial revolution. Maybe he was reading Toffler. Uh, but clearly this was a reference to an industrialized society. That very much resonated with Nehru, who clearly was uh, a person who was uh, biased in favor of industry and clearly a very urbanized individual himself. But that view was in contradiction with the view of Gandhi, who, were, who had a mystical attachment to villages. Uh, and so there again, there was this tension between two ideas and what way what vision should be? What should the new city look like? What should be the vision for this new urban India, if you will? And Corbu's answer was very simple. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm going a little too fast, I guess. Uh, did I screw up? How do I do this? No. Before this, yeah, I'm still here. Okay. So, what he was saying is that if you wear pants, you speak English, you aspire for a democratic government. What is Indian? Why this obsession with Indian? If you are going and you want industry, then why this obsession with uh, with Indian? Now, there is a little bit of arrogance there in that observation. Uh, one may, uh, you know, discern, uh, but clearly it, it was a message. So in one sense, the meeting of Nehru and Korbu at a time when Nehru himself was floundering as to what should India look like was very, very important. Uh, and in one sense, Korbu became Nehru's teacher, if you will, uh, or a person at least who helped him frame that vision, you know, so that as a consequence of that, uh, Nehru then embarked, uh, you know, Chandigarh then became a metaphor uh, for uh, modern India. Uh, it became a metaphor for modern India, and it is, on, it is from that that Nehru then ultimately negotiated a deal with MIT to set up Indian Institutes of Technology, which today I'm told uh, are much more difficult to get into than MIT is, 
uh, and uh, of course negotiated a deal with Harvard to open a business school, which are now Indian Institute of Management. And I'm told that, in fact, I know so, in fact, uh, someone was telling me earlier today, uh, a, a student in, in India who scored 97% or, or 95% on the exam couldn't get into Indian Institute of Management but have been given full fellowship here at Harvard Business School. So uh, India's loss, Harvard's gain. Uh, but that relationship also really basically stems from that, uh, that metaphor. Uh, it is that relationship that basically works. So as I said, it was the basically the Redmond plan, uh, you know, which is uh, the inspiration for Meyer uh, in New Jersey. Uh, circa 1929 or 28 or something like that, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, uh, did. And now if you look at the two plans, uh, the city center uh, uh, is uh, in Myers' plan here in the center, and, and in Corbu's plan, uh, it has been put on the top. Other than that, there's really not much uh, uh, change. Uh, the roads are a little more curved in the Meyer plan uh, on uh, on uh, on uh, Jane Drew's insistence, uh, Corbu made some concessions as far as that was concerned. Corbu's wisdom was, you know, he didn't understand why people make these curved lines. He says, you know, it's only a donkey if you lose, let him lose, he meanders around. A man always walks from one place to another place in a straight line. And so that should be <laughs> your thinking. I mean, amazing man, uh, you know, with uh, amazing ideas. Uh, and of course, he also enlarged the size of the super blocks uh, in the plan that basically he he, he did. And uh, sort of. And, and incidentally, uh, I threw this in for uh, you know fun. Uh, they have even made uh, manholes uh, with these uh, uh, with the master plan that Corbu did. And this one, by the way, just sold in New York uh, or somewhere in the United States. I'm told for thirty-five thousand dollars. Uh, it has become a, a cottage industry to pilfer Corbu stuff from Chandigarh and to sell it on the open market. Uh, and so all the furniture has suddenly disappeared uh, and many other things, uh, you know, have, have disappeared. You know, I wish I had, except this stuff would have been very heavy to carry it, uh, you know. But I wish if I had taken a few of those, I could have happily looked forward to retirement given how the stock market is doing and what my retirement portfolio looks like presently. So <coughs> this is the team that Corbu put together. Uh, and uh, you have, uh, actually it was P.L. Varma, uh, who is a, a civil engineer, uh, and uh, the administrator, P. N. Thapper, uh, who made the trip to Paris. I was able to interview for the book uh, that I did, uh, uh, Mr. Varma, but I was not able to uh, interview Thapar, although he was still living, but he was in a very poor health, and his family uh, requested me not to press the issue, and I had to defer that uh, in light of the fact that he died very shortly thereafter. And then, of course, Pierre Jeanneret, his, his cousin, and, and this coming, Pierre Jeanneret and him coming together, Corbu coming together in itself has a side story. Apparently, they were pursuing a, a same woman, uh, Corbu won, uh, and so they were not on speaking terms with each other. Uh, but in the interest of the larger uh, cause, uh, meaning architecture, they did come together and join hands. And then, of course, Max Fry and his wife, Jane Drew, uh, who were also recruited for this Chandigarh project. I thought I'll throw these in uh, to provide a human face as well. Uh, since we talk about these people, oftentimes we don't know what these guys really look like, and they're quite human, just like the rest of us. Uh, uh, as you can very clearly see, uh, this particular uh, Gandhi Bhavan Auditorium, uh, which is in Chandigarh with a water body around it, uh, was designed in a very modernist style uh, by Jean Ray and Fry. And of course, people were really amazed, uh, you know, and also very disturbed by these designs. Uh, they didn't look Indian. They looked whatever they looked. Maybe they, you know, they certainly didn't look Indian. And this was very disconcerting to many people. Nehru, on the other hand, argued that, look, we have to think anew. I support Corbu. What he is doing, I don't approve of everything he is doing. 
but I like some of the buildings very much. The important thing is that whatever he is doing, he is hitting Indians on their head, and they need to be hit on their head because they need to think differently than they are used to thinking differently. We have been too static in our thinking. We have to bring new way of looking at things. And this, again, is a continuous story in the Indian story of uh, you know, urbanism that basically exists. Uh, you have a modern house that Fry and Drew did uh, on, the, on the top left, and then, of course, the high school that Drew did. And again, they're trying to, because one of the things that they found in Chandigarh, and practically every Western architect that has entered India has had to deal with, is how to control light, uh, the sunlight, the heat. That's been the biggest thing. And of course, uh, that has been the principal play. Uh, that, and so Korbu, of course, found answers by building parasols on top of the buildings, uh, you know, uh, that you will see momentarily. Uh, and uh, Louis Khan, who later on went to India, uh, came up with a different uh, interpretation of that, uh, and we will be able to take a look at that also. Uh, this is, uh, at the top, is an administrative building in Punjab. Uh, some of these pictures are from a very earlier time, and I think that sort of, and so, the reason I mixed uh, some more recent pictures with the old picture is to give you a flavor of that time when even the scaffolding was not there to do it. Not that it is there today. They were still using uh, bamboo scaffolding, and it is still very, you know, used quite, quite freely. Uh, uh, Raul, you will have to keep me honest. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, and so, uh, and then the market in Chandigarh, one in, in one of the blocks, super blocks, and uh, the administrative Punjab with, uh, building, uh, which was done uh, by Jean Ray. Uh, again, uh, you can see very clear modernist lines. Uh, and one of the reasons why ultimately modernism is accepted in India is because it didn't have any colonial connotations. And religiously, it was neutral. And this is one of the reasons why Nehru was drawn to modernism, because in a pluralistic, religiously pluralistic society such as India, especially given the tension between the Hindus and the Muslims, Modernism was seen as an idiom that would be acceptable to everybody, you know, and that it would not uh, fire up religious uh, animosity between different communities, and therefore it would be more acceptable. Of course, you could Indianize it however you want it, as you shall be seeing uh, some examples of how modernism itself became a Veda in its own right, the fifth Veda, I call it, uh, which continues to be used uh, with uh, uh, different results in different hands. Uh, of course, Korbu did the city center, uh, which is a pedestrian friendly uh, uh, area. Uh, and of course, this fountain is a later addition to it. Uh, again, a place where uh, the residents of Chandigarh love to go and hang out in the evening. And it's also a place for young people in love who want to date and not be seen how they cannot be seen in a major plaza, in a major market, uh, is another matter. Uh, <clears throat> what is interesting, however, is uh, that, uh, I lost the thought. Uh, uh, well, it'll come back to me, and I'll come to, come to it momentarily. Capital complex, that is Corbu's uh, biggest uh, story. Now, uh, in 1999, Chandigarh celebrated its 50th anniversary. Uh, they were gracious enough to invite me, uh, and among many others, including Charles Jenks, um, Kenneth uh, Frampton, <laughs> and many others who, who were uh, out there uh, in 1999. Uh, Again, he uses an industrial metaphor. This is a, built, uh, this is a cooling tower uh, in, an, in a factory that he had seen in Ahmedabad, in Gujarat. And, and, and he uh, brought that, and he uses that on top of the assembly building. And that, again, becomes a metaphor for industrialization. You know? So the whole story really is about how to industrialize India. Uh, and architecture then becomes a vehicle for proselytizing the population and selling the whole idea of industrialization and whatever price and the cost is built into it is then you know, measured in those, in those terms. Uh, 
this is the assembly building, and in many ways it uh, sort of uh, speaks to the uh, building that he did uh, in France, a housing complex. Uh, and again, the top uh, one is uh, from the early days uh, when the building was still uh, coming up, and you can see uh, the cows are grazing on the grass out there. And of course, you see a more complete uh, version of it over here. And this in itself has come under uh, some criticism. Now, there is a certain thinking which, is, which has gone in the Secretariat building and the Assembly building. The debate was which is more important, uh, given the fact that much of the bureaucracy is the one that carries out the work. Uh, that building was going to be much larger than the assembly building, and therefore it will be more dominant building. However, that defeats the very objective of democracy. In a democracy, the deliberations are in an assembly. So there was this particular debate, and so he tried to make the assembly more monumental, and, and therefore also the cooling tower that goes on top of uh, the assembly building. Uh, high court building, uh, again, uh, water body is put in it, and as I mentioned to you, these parasols that were built with concrete are designed to keep the building cool. Now, it is another matter uh, when this particular high court was built, uh, the sunset was such that the judges couldn't see the, <laughs> the lawyers and the people in the court, so they have to do some creative thinking to rectify that particular problem. And the Chandigarh Museum, which was built by Jean Ray, which is very much out there. Now, of course, there has been a criticism. Uh, and you know, Charles Correa has, of course, very rightly pointed out, what is the point of pouring so much concrete uh, in a city such as, uh, such as Chandigarh? But the other side of the coin is that it also gave impetus for a new industry to develop in India. Uh, and that industry is the concrete industry. You know, uh, yes. In those days, there was shortage, but today there is no such problem. Uh, so it was the beginning. So again, it's one idea leading to the birth of a different situation. Uh, and then, of course, this has just recently been completed. Uh, actually, this was completed uh, about 10 years ago uh, at the time of uh, the 50th anniversary. The open hand had been created. And, and this idea actually has been with for many, many years, many decades, I should say, and ultimately it was Jane Drew who persuaded him to build this monument in the capital complex, open to give, open to receive. And this was, uh, there was supposed to be a uh, governor's house, uh, which of course was vetoed because Nehru felt that the governor's house in the capital complex was rather ostentatious and spoke about Imperial New Delhi, which was always in the background, and you didn't want to repeat those mistakes that the British had made when they were building New Delhi. And then, of course, the Museum of Knowledge. Now, this is also very interesting. Museum of Knowledge has not yet been built. There is a mark that exists. But the museum itself has not been built. But even if the museum has not been built, it has succeeded to radiate the ideas that came out of that notion. The ideas what he was envisioning. This is 1950. And what he is envisioning is these round books, DVDs, and tapes, and books that could be read on those things, which is exactly what we are doing today, 60 some years later. Uh, and so it is really amazing that his vision, you know, I mean, this is like some guy who's a science fiction writer, you know, who's attempting a architectural uh, work. And in many ways, uh, it worked to India's advantage to have gained some sort of a footing for information technology. Uh, and that information technology that today India is one of the leading uh, producer of software uh, may well be tied to those original ideas that basically emerge. Once again, that frame of ideas and vision coming together to create a whole new situation sort of thing. So, <coughs> and of course, Burma, who understood uh, Chandigarh's climate can be pretty hot in the summertime, although it is uh, brutally cold in winter as well, uh, that there should be a lake out there. And so the lake was uh, created, which is a three square kilometer uh, uh, lake. And of course, 
the Chandigarh residents uh, value that. Uh, incidentally, uh, every year for the last at least two decades that I can think, that Chandigarh continues to be rated as the most livable city in India, uh, most desirable city. It's not Bombay, it's not Delhi, it's not Calcutta, it's Chandigarh at the top of the list. Many businesses, many corporations, many retirees have all moved to Chandigarh uh, because of its livable uh, conditions. And then, of course, almost contemporaneously was being built Bhubaneswar for very different reasons, however. Uh, there is a political story, I won't go into it, and the political story is that uh, the British had fused Bengal, Orissa, and Bihar together, and the Uriyas were very unhappy about it, and so they were successful in 1936 to create their own state. And so, uh, you know, that uh, Bhubaneswar city was built. And the author of that master plan was, uh, was uh, Otto Koenigsberger. Uh, and over here, you can see uh, Nehru and Otto Koenigsberger over here. And this is Rajkumari Amrit Kaur, uh, another very influential figure in those early years after India's independence, who played a pivotal role. She was responsible for rehabilitating the refugees. And so, therefore, she was very, very important person. She is also the one who stole away Otto Konisberger from Bhubaneswar and took him to central government. And as a consequence, Bhubaneswar lost uh, a very visionary person. Now, he had said, again in Bhubaneswar, that same debate erupted, Indian versus non-Indian. And they wanted to build a monument. And Otto said, yes, we will build a monument to Gandhi. But let us celebrate his ideas. Uh, and I'll come to that momentarily, and this is the plan. And in many ways, in this plan, Otto was inspired uh, by the ideas of uh, Surya Mata and uh, Lenidov and uh, you know, Wright as well. What he said was that the urban growth develops along the traffic arteries. And in India, that is essentially true. Uh, and so the expansion of the city should be in that direction as the city develops. And that pretty much has been uh, preserved. And on the right, you see, is one of the neighborhood units that he basically designed. Uh, so coming back to what I was saying earlier on, uh, to build a Gandhi memorial, uh, people want to stick Gandhi's face uh, somewhere, you know, Gandhi himself, in physical form. And what Otto was saying is that now, you don't want Gandhi's statue out there. You want to celebrate his ideas, ideas of self-sufficiency, which are exemplified in his weaving of cloth. You know, so he built this particular drawing, uh, which is a very rare drawing, incidentally, uh, and I'm very happy to have had. By the way, uh, those of you who are doing some research uh, in any of these areas, you can find uh, the primary source materials that I used. I photocopied pretty much everything. On Chandigarh, all of the material is available at UCLA. On uh, Bhubaneswar and in Gandhi Nagar, all of the material is available at, the U at UPenn University uh, in the Louis Kahn collection. Uh, you know, so it fits in there. So for those of you who want to go and you know, want to look at some of that material, you know where to go. Uh, so uh, instead, uh, this idea was, of course, uh, trashed. And then you see the regular statues that celebrate. In Chandigarh, there is not one statue, incidentally. And that was possible because Korbu vetoed that idea absolutely. And he had the full backing of Nehru. Uh, and this is sort of amazing that uh, you know, nobody has tried to violate that, although there have been attempts. Uh, this is the assembly. Uh, you can, uh, that, uh, so most of the work, uh, architectural work, was done by Julius Vaz, who was a student at JJ School of Art in Bombay the only school of uh, architecture that existed in pre-independence India. And he had been a student of Claude Bartley. Uh, Claude Bartley was an English uh, architect who worked in India. And basically, he preached that you should absolutely reject anything Western. There is enough richness in Indian culture that you should try to pull out of the India's past rather than embrace all these crazy. And he was also very anti-modernist, uh, having been trained in the view of tradition. So, uh, uh, Vaz uh, pretty much followed that thinking. Uh, so here in the Secretariat building, what you see is a kind of a, uh, allusion to Shiva Langa. Now, Bhubaneswar and the state of Orissa, uh, Shiv, uh, God Shiva, 
is a very prominent god. So Linga tradition is much stronger than the Vaishnava uh, tradition is. So there is that illusion that you find uh, at the entrance and also as you enter into the, into the, into the Secretariat, you find uh, some more impressions of that. Now, for the uh, auditorium, uh, this is the auditorium, uh, see the similarity that he is drawn from the Buddhist stupa in the nearby Dupa uh, uh, Dhaligiri Hills. Uh, and so, uh, again, uh, there is this, uh, you know, romanticism going back, uh, you know, to the past rather than looking forward to the future. Of course, these are some modern, uh, this is a Sanic school, which is of more recent vintage. Uh, Sanic meaning military school, that you see uh, a more modern house, uh, and then of course the Kesri cinema. I mean, some of these uh, renditions of modern architecture are really mind-boggling, you know, and you sort of wonder whether you are in, um, uh, <laughs> you know, some space galaxy or something, you know, which is very interesting. Uh, uh, again, uh, this is, of course, uh, dates back to earlier time, and now, of course, uh, multiple housing. Now, one thing which had come up on the issue of housing, which I think is very important to most of us, uh, since we need a roof over our heads, uh, although I'm told that in the studios here the roof does leak, uh, but I'd like to know which roof doesn't. Uh, but interestingly enough, uh, the question came up uh, on what should be the housing. And in the early 50s, and well into the 60s, and even 70s, I would argue, that most people didn't like multi-story buildings. Uh, uh, power was always in short supply, and most people in the summer months liked to sleep outside or on top of the, uh, on their roofs, essentially, which was natural air conditioning. So living in a multi story building and in apartments was, uh, at least for the middle class, was not a very popular idea. That idea has changed. Uh, so that many houses which were built, even in Chandigarh, have now turned into uh, multiple flats. Uh, the sad part is that the basic infrastructure, drainage, sewage, have remained essentially the same. So the pressure on the natural resources, on, 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 on the utilities and on the services, has only mounted and made things uh, a little aggravating. Uh, uh, in the market, the inspiration were the nearby uh, Khandagiri uh, hill caves or the elephant caves as they are known and there is some similarity uh, here also you can see the illusion that uh, Vaz was trying to make again the inspiration is in the past not in the future which is what uh, Kobu was trying to do and you can clearly see the contrast in the way things moved in this place uh, now of course I, I was there I was on a Fulbright uh, in 2007 uh, in, in India, and I had an opportunity to visit Bhubaneswar, and, and I, I was really stunned to see the changes that have occurred in, even in Bhubaneswar. Uh, you know, the modern buildings and the discotheques and the nightclubs and the lifestyle, you know, was all very promising. So yes, ideas come, but they have their impact felt very slowly. And clearly, over a period of time, you're beginning to see, and this is of course being uh, done in the port city of Pradeep, uh, and uh, as you can see, this is another skyscraper. Now the Gandhi Nagar story is very interesting. It starts really with Khan Seminar, Louis Khan Seminar in, 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 uh, in Ahmedabad. Uh, Khan of course had been recruited, uh, and Doshi played a very prominent role, uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with his name, Krishna Doshi, and he had been to La Jolla and he had seen the stock, uh, you know, towers, and, and he was stunned. He was a very young man at that time. He had uh, worked very closely with Corvo, and now what he saw was Khan's work, uh, you know, all in concrete, stunning, and he felt that these were the buildings that belonged in India. So he was able to get very close with Khan, and he worked very closely with Khan. Uh, Khan peaked at a time when, uh, when I suppose modernism and postmodernism, whatever that is, intersected. I'm still trying to figure out what postmodernism is. Uh, if somebody has some uh, very concise thinking on it, I would love to profit from that thinking. Uh, but Khan arrived there, and, 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 and when Khan arrived there, they tried to recruit Khan as 
Gujarat state had been formed in 1960 as a consequence of the breakup of the Bombay state, which included Gujarat earlier. And so Khan, uh, uh, you know, uh, Doshi, of course, played a very prominent role, and that's Doshi. Uh, and the other person who played a prominent role was Charles Kuria and Hasmukh Patel. These were three very prominent architects uh, who were working in that particular area. And then, of course, the fourth architect was Achut Kanminde, a graduate of Harvard in 1949, who had been a student of Gropius, as a matter of fact. So he, of course, was imbued with all uh, everything modern, if you will. Uh, uh, Charles had been a graduate of MIT. I believe that's very nearby somewhere. Uh, and, and, uh, and Patel had come from Cornell. Uh, so again, all from three major Ivy League schools who were out there. And, of course, uh, uh, he had been a graduate of Jaya School of Arts, but then he had apprenticed with uh, uh, Corbu in France and then Khan later on. So there was very keen interest in recruiting them. They needed a patron. And as every architect knows, you need a patron. Otherwise, your best ideas remain nothing more than uh, ideas and don't go very far from the drawing board. And so the patron was Kastur Bhai Lal Bhai a man who had not been able to complete his education, and therefore he was passionate about education, uh, and instrumental in uh, bringing the Indian Institute of Management to Bombay, which was, uh, to Ahmedabad, which was actually slated to go to Bombay, uh, and also building other institutions. So the whole idea was to building institutions, a notion that had been built, started by, by Khorbu, and now with Bombay gone for Gujarat, it was even more important that they should have the institutions of their own. They won't have to rely on Bombay anymore. So they wanted to build schools, universities, uh, technology institutes, engineering schools, what have you. You know, they wanted uh, that uh, modernization process to become. And Khan was picked to be the man. And Lal Bhai, Kustur Bhai Lal Bhai decided that he was going to funnel. In fact, he offered out of his own pocket $100,000. In, 19, in 1962. That's mucho dinero in 1962. Uh, in today's term, if you work in the inflation, I haven't calculated it, you can figure it out, whatever that comes to. Uh, but that didn't happen uh, for a number of reasons. And so the story moved. But before all of this had happened, uh, on the, I, I thought I'd share with you uh, the Sabarmati Ashram of Gandhi's. Uh, this was done by Charles after he had finished at MIT, and this is his first work after he returns to India from uh, the Boston area. Uh, and he does the Sabarmati Ashram. As you can see, very clear, very clean, modernist line, and it's still a place worth visiting. And I encourage those who are interested in architecture to please visit this work. It's one of his finest work. I still Although Kanchenjunga has made much more noise at multi-storied building that he has built in Bombay, but this remains very dear to my heart. Uh, and of course, uh, this is another interesting uh, Doshi's work. Uh, this is Gufa, or cave, that he and uh, Emma Hussain, who just recently died at age 95, as you may know, uh, and became very controversial in his later years, especially because of his obsession with Madhuri Dikshit and Madonna, uh, and something which I think happened to Korbu also in his later years, but I won't get into those details. Uh, so both Doshi and, 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 and uh, Hussein are graduates of Geja School of Arts in Bombay. Uh, and uh, you know this is their uh, creation. Uh, a building uh, that uh, Korbu did, uh, Mill Owners Association building, uh, in Ahmedabad. Uh, this is before even Gandhinagar had come into existence. Uh, you know, uh, this was done, in, I believe, in 1954. Uh, and then you see a later picture, all the uh, interesting architects around here on top of that building. Uh, and that you see another uh, entrance uh, to that. Uh, all the architects are celebrating uh, a late afternoon lunch on top of the mill owners' uh, building. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is the Shodan House, uh, which also Kobu did in 1956. Uh, again, this is uh, widely studied, at least uh, at City College. Uh, kids uh, usually do these drawings uh, of, of the Shodan House, and they manipulate uh, the master plan. 
so uh, again, uh, work in concrete. Uh, very difficult to get into uh, if you are in Ahmedabad uh, because the family is very shy about <coughs> coming. So Khan was already building in Ahmedabad when the Gandhi Nagar project came up and had, you know, and so this is the Indian Institute of Management that he was building, which he elected to build with brick as opposed to concrete. And so the IAM, in a manner of speaking, st uh, stands in contrast as a counterpoint to Corbu's work. Interesting. There was one occasion on when both were in, together at UPenn, and Doshi offered to introduce them. Uh, Khan was somewhat diffident, uh, so he said, maybe another time. So he, they never did meet. It's a very interesting story. Doshi called uh, Korbu acrobat, and he called uh, 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 Khan a yogi, uh, largely because uh, uh, Korbu would have no compunctions about breaking a building down or drawing down and starting from scratch, whereas uh, 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 Khan was much more reflective. You might say that Korbu spoke with the certainty of the Calvinist that he was, and uh, and 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 uh, and uh, 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 Khan, on the other hand, was much more Jungian in his thinking uh, and much more reflected. One of the problems uh, of that was that he was awfully slow, painfully slow, in finishing his work and even revising his work multiple times, which made his clients go crazy. Uh, and that is exactly what happened at IAM when he was let go. Uh, but he did build the capital uh, complex for, Bangla, for Bangladesh. But again, he was trying to tame the light in these things. And it's really a fascinating building to see these open spaces uh, and how you can interconnect with each other and the movement and people. Ultimately, architecture is about what? People. If it segregates you, isolates you, what's the point? You know, and so you see, you know, some of these interesting interplay of lights that you in, in Khan's work that, uh, and and people were sensitized about how to control light. You know, many architects who have worked with Khan uh, in Ahmedabad basically made that particular point uh, to me. And so uh, here is a classroom that you see uh, that uh, Khan uh, basically did, and so. You know, you see the commencement over here, uh, some more uh, images of the Indian Institute of uh, Management. As I noted earlier, it was supposed to go to uh, Bombay, but uh, Kasur Bhai Lal Bhai uh, was able to persuade Nehru to bring it to Ahmedabad instead. Now, so by the time the uh, Gandhi Nagar project came, uh, you know, this was, uh, Khan was not uh, the guy who was selected. And the story is a little complicated. But <clears throat> it's nicely documented in the book. I hope you will buy it so that I can get rich and live happily ever after. Uh, but uh, Mewara was an interesting character. He too was educated at Cornell. And then gone to the Illinois Institute of Technology to do city planning from there before returning back to India and then getting a job uh, first uh, with, uh, uh, with, with the Rajasthan government and eventually with the Gujarat government, and he was then picked to do it. He was very agreeable. A rare quality in an Indian, which I am still trying to cultivate, not very successfully. Uh, so he was a very agreeable kind of guy. And so this was one of the reasons why he was able to kind of get it. Again, as you can see in the master plan, uh, there is nothing very remarkably uh, innovative about it. Uh, the uh, assembly building that he sort of built, uh, if you really look at it from the outside, it looks like a cinema hall to me. And I made that point. Somebody actually really uh, complimented me for doing that and, and then uh, castigated me for not making the similar kind of analogies about other architecture in India. Uh, as if uh, making uh, some pungent observations uh, makes you uh, some sort of a, a more acceptable critic than you would be otherwise. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, as you can see, Gandhi's statue is right in front of it, and, and this is all lit up on a Diwali day, uh, the Festival of Lights. Now, here he did something very again. Again, 
the past and religion plays a much more dominant influence. And modernism has been adapted, you know, if you will, in a manner of speaking. Assembly chambers are inspired by the inner sanctum of scores of Indian temples. And interestingly enough, you know, the column, central column, is uh, 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 this, the, the interior structure of the assembly is inspired by the lotus flower. And so lotus flower is very important in Hindu mythology and Hindu religion, practically. Uh, it's supposed to be Lakshmi's uh, 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 vehicle, if you will, uh, on the water, uh, and uh, associated with Lord Vishnu as well, uh, and the central column, uh, uh, you know, holds the building. And this, of course, is the inner sanctum. Again, temple, looking to the past, rather than to the, to, the, to the future. I'm going to run, I, I know, uh, uh, yeah, uh, he's sort of, now here it is very interesting. Again, to some extent he was influenced by, the, uh, by New Delhi, uh, where there are two, uh, South Block and North Block, where the administrative offices are uh, in, in, in Delhi. So he put the assembly building in the middle of the two and connected them by two overhanging bridges. Unfortunately, nobody uses the bridges because of the fear of terrorism. You know, so they have really remained dormant, uh, essentially. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, kind of a you know, model which uh, more clearly shows the two bridges than actually you are able to see it in the picture. Uh, auditorium in Sector 17, which occupies about 185 acres uh, and will contain, you know, it's still a work in progress, which is, uh, you know, we built, they have built another structure on it. Uh, and then, of course, Near Gandhi Nagar, you have Akshardham. Technology has arrived in India, as you might have gathered from your various trips to India, and is being used in every sphere, including in religion. And Akshardham is an interesting mix of Disneyland and spiritual salvation, if you will. Uh, so you see, in fact, it's much more fun to go to Akshardham than to go to Gandhi Nagar, you know. And, and so you have the spiritual water show that goes on at the time and the leisure show that goes uh, at the same time. I mean, it's just fascinating how to see how they have really done it. And there have been architects from around the world who have contributed to it, mostly European, uh, you know, but there have been some Americans as well. I'm not going to start listing their names because otherwise uh, I'll upset Rahul. Uh, and of course, the same vision. Remember the first picture I showed you? Uh, of uh, uh, Korbu's first initial drawing about India being a peasant civilization and a bullock and, and a master plan in that thing, that was the beginning of it. That's where we started from. That's where India started from. This is not a city which has been built as yet. What is one of the fascinating things about technology is that today, uh, because of uh, Auto AutoCAD and other mechanisms, you can do all these computer generated images, you know. So, you know, I mean, on a slow day, you know, when uh, there's no good game going on on the TV, you know, you can create your own fun. Uh, and so you have all these wonderful uh, images. This is a city which is actually on the works. Uh, it's called GIFT, uh, Gujarat Information Financial Technology City. Uh, remember, just a minute ago, I was talking about Lotus as the inspiration. Here, they are saying that this financial capital is going to surpass anything that exists on this earth. New York, Hong Kong, what have you. So the aspirations have certainly gone you know, far beyond looking back to the Lotus Age or to the peasant culture. So the, it's the same, and, and the collaborators is a Chinese company that is working on it. And here are some interesting buildings that they have developed. They expect this city will become the center of diamond industry in which Gujaratis, of course, excel. So here is a, a rendition <laughs> of, 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 uh, of a diamond tower, and this is a close-up of it uh, that you can very clearly see. Actually, I added these as a second thought. I was not going to include it. Uh, Nora, by accident, had put this image uh, on, uh, on the poster, and I myself was not aware what the hell is this. Uh, and so then when I did some research and I called some people in Ahmedabad and I said, what is this thing? You know, th these are called Naga Towers or Cobra Towers. Okay? There is an illusion again to religion, but again it has been modernized and this is what 
uh, it looks like or will look like uh, when completed and uh, after it is implemented. And of course, a city for the next generation. So as the new generations comes up, as you, some of the students in this room and others in other places in the world, as they grow up and take the lead in India's future, there is hope. It may not become the superpower, but certainly uh, it is in a state of change, and a change, a happy change, and, and that, of course, will remain to be seen. In 1964, January, four months or five months before Nehru died, this picture dates back to January of 1964, in which he said, he's telling him, or at least this is available at the Chandigarh Museum, I'm 77 years old and my moral philosophy can be reduced to this. In life it is necessary above all to act, and by that I mean to act in a spirit of modesty. I don't think that really applies to Korbu. Uh, with exactitude, perhaps, with precision, the only possible atmosphere in which to carry on creative work is one in which these qualities prevail. Regularity, modesty, continuity, and perseverance. So this is where we are. Uh, and these ideas, uh, uh, so Purbu's gift to India was, with all its flaws and faults, a modernist vocabulary, a vocabulary that has generated a whole new series of thinking that transcends architecture. And I think that is where the value lies. The real value of any architecture is not what it meets its immediate needs, but what it generates in way of ideas and visions for the future. Thank you. inequitable kinds of, kinds of society and their representation. And all the three cities you showed us, or at least the aspirations of their cities, were really founded on equity in, in many ways, uh, including the form of the houses, the nature of the housing. So what might be your thoughts on that? Well, uh, no question that that uh, India has not been a society. It has uh, certainly modernized, and it is one of uh, the part that it is member of G20 now, uh, you know, and that, uh, you know, and even viewed by the United States as a counter uh, leverage to the rise of China and, and, and so many other ways that India's importance lies. The problem is, <laughs> that all the wealth that has generated had had to be distributed on a very large population. So the results become diluted as they have, you know, expanded, uh, you know, sort of thing. And so that uh, is still a work in progress, if you will. Uh, if India can sustain the 7 or 8 percent growth that it has been able to do it, uh, in the hope, with, with the proviso that by 19 uh, I mean 2020 as they're saying that the population growth is going to stabilize and it is already under two point now, uh, then uh, I think you will be, be able to see a better distribution of that wealth. Other questions? You guys are very kind to me. Yeah. Uh, but the generation of the wealth is not uh, based on natural resources. It's based on uh, capital formation. And that's different than, say, from the Arab states, the Gulf states, oil states, which are building uh, modernist uh, constructions as, as Dubai, well, yeah. but not, not based on uh, really fundamental generation of, of profits. They're just sort of lucky because they're sitting on a pool of You're oil. You're absolutely right. I agree So with there's you. something else going on, like the city that and you're as showing. A of, as a matter of fact, what you're saying is very important in one sense, because in that sense, I think it is not bearing only on natural resources. 
I think the Arab states are beginning to realize that those natural resources are not inexhaustible. Uh, and they have already started to look at different ways. And I think and since the Western countries are beginning to look at alternative, uh, alternatives to fossil fuel, uh, I think that it's going to play even more uh, an important role in the uh, you know, sort of thing. I think these present conflict in the Middle East and our own involvement in the Middle East is a reflection of that. I think that realization has come to us as well, and not just to us, but uh, to Europe and other Western countries. The huge consumers of uh, natural resources, uh, as far as fossil fuel is concerned, are now India and China, as a matter of fact. Uh, so that India is relying on capital formulation and, 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 and technical know-how and not depending entirely on natural resources, I think would speak well for India in the future uh, than one would think otherwise. But you make a very, very important point. Hi. Um, my question for you is, uh, well, the last couple of slides you showed um, this new plan for a city in Gujarat. And I was, the, the, the gift city. Yeah, and yeah. I was wondering, um, comparing that to what people like Le Corbusier was doing, have they shown signs that they've learned from the previous generation of, of city builders? Yeah, but like I said, I mean, I think uh, if Corbu was to be resurrected, I know this is a Lent season, uh, I'm sure he would be pleased uh, by the changes that have occurred, although uh, that may not be exactly his vision, so to speak. But if you really look at it, you know, Christianity, when it spread to different parts of the world, it ultimately adapted itself to local culture. So that when you're listening to a mass in Africa or in Vatican uh, or in New York City, you have different flavor in each place. You know, same thing with Islam. It's not any different with architecture as well of modernism. Uh, modernism, wherever it has gone, it has had to adapt to the local cultural conditions and preferences. So in so far as that is concerned, you know, it has sort of achieved that you know, uh, goal. But I think the more enduring legacy, and you're making a very, very important, you're asking a very important question. As I said in my closing remarks, the important thing is not that what Kobe brought the modernist vocabulary, but that vocabulary became an instrument, if you will, a catalyst for thinking you know, about the future and framing that future, however absurd it may be. You know, the point is that it is still framed. And out of that silliness and foolishness and craziness, some good may result. Uh, you know, and that's the only thing which keeps us going. Every morning when I roll out of the bed, what makes me go out? Hope. Or you. Or anyone. It's hope. And it is that hope, I think, that uh, he was able to generate for the future. You know, and I think that was a huge... Uh, shift in, in, in India. I, the big mega cities like Bombay, Calcutta, never achieved that thing. They became magnets for drawing people for livelihood. Bombay still attracts people. People go to Bombay in the hope that they're going to become film stars, you know, in the same way that New York does, uh, or Los Angeles does, you know, sort of thing. But it doesn't change their thinking. And, uh, you know, and, and what this did, I mean, these cities have not been catalysts for change. You know, they offer bakshish, if you will, or a livelihood. And what he did was to change the way of thinking. And I think that is far more compelling and powerful than simply making a living. You made this uh, point about giving a very unbiased view about Chandigarh, uh, where Corbu has. I'm glad this you own. think that way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, when you were speaking, you were giving an unbiased view about his uh, arrogance, and at the same time, about how people, other people, reacted about it not being a Gandhian, um, uh, not following a Gandhian principle. Um, do you still feel that Chandigarh can be, or? is um, keeping up to a status of being a visionary city, which is 
uh, when we're talking about now density and sustainability in cities and uh, trying to make them more compact, does it still satisfy that role? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, yes, but again, this uh, back and forth between future and the past is a running theme in India. Uh, and I don't think this is going to go away. But this, in many ways, becomes an instrument, has served at least so far to generate new ideas. You know, I mean, look at this. I'm going to quote you Doshi. Uh, and he makes this observation in the 90s in an interview that he created a, 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 a sort of a summation of his life's work. I have gradually discovered that the buildings that I have designed seem somewhat foreign and out of milieu. This is a guy who been groomed by Kurbu and Khan. He is saying this. They do not appear to have their roots in the Indian soil. In the 90s. Okay. He is the guy who was struck by Khan's sock towers in La Jolla in California. With the experience of my work over the years and my own observation, I'm trying to understand a little about my people, their traditions and social customs and their philosophy of life. So even to the extent that those who became early converts to modernist thinking and were proselytized by people like Kurdu and Khan, that they, when they go back and re-examine their own past, they're not going to see it in the old traditional way. They will see it from the prism of their experience. So in that effort, you will see a completely new image. You see what I'm saying? Or, uh, or, or did I lose you? You, you? you get it? So even when they go back and re-examine, their own historic past and their own roots, they look very different. Very much like I do when I go back to India or when Rahul does. Sort of thing. And this tradition has it, at least existed since the days of the Bengal Renaissance, uh, from the days of uh, Ramon Roy. That duality of thinking, that duality of thinking was very present in Nehru and everybody else who has been exposed to both East and West. And in you. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, but India's population was very different. I mean, uh, clearly this is a garden city model that was followed in Chandigarh. And what Kodbu was talking about was a high dense city that he talked about in his book. Uh, you know, that is not the so kind of thing. Yes. I mean, yeah, really sure, sure, sure. And, and, and in some sense, uh, Chandigarh is evolving into that today. I mean, you know, all of, I remember as a kid going to Chandigarh because my father was in the government service. Firstly, the problem was finding the damn house because they all look the same. You know, and for a 10-year-old kid, you know, being able to distinguish between houses that looked remarkably similar, you know, I frequently ended up in somebody else's house and they were always kind enough to guide me to the right place. So I never lost my parents. Uh, but the interesting thing is that all that is changing. In fits and starts, and slowly, but it is changing. And, and, and the density is coming. There is no, with the price of land escalating the way it has escalated, it's impossible that it will not. Those days that when you had a separate bungalow with huge land that the British built, those, very few of them are left. And even those which are left in Delhi, which are now considered historic, there has been a debate about that, whether or not to preserve them or to demolish them. One last question. Right. Um, I was wondering if you could just <clears throat> say a little bit about the relationship of Shantigar to, or to a, a, um, a city in a non-Indian context. Like, for example, um, when you say that Shantigar has sort of the highest quality of life in, in India, um, I'm not so sure that Brasilia has that 
No, but, 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 but again, uh, Brazil, have, uh, Brazil has Rio, and, and, and all, the, all the politicians like to live in Rio. It's more fun. Uh, you know, then, uh, you know, sort of, although that is beginning to change from what I understand from my, my friends that, uh, you know, the more and more people are beginning to sort of think. I mean, to use Corbu's word to tell you that, I mean, Corbu said there are only two cities in the world right now that are being built which are worth their salt. One is Chandigarh that he was building and the other is Brasilia that his student was building, Oscar Nemia, you know. So he clearly had that take on that thing. But you're right. I mean, uh, Brasilia, uh, and Chandigarh also suffered from the same problems and same criticism. So did Gandhi Nagar. I mean, when I was doing research over there and some people in the chief minister's office, uh, you know, asked me, he says, uh, sir, since you know some politicians and you've been able to get into some offices that most of us cannot get into, do you think you can influence them to build some recreational things? Because there is really nothing to do once the offices close here, which was true. You know, and Brasilia sort of fits into that mood. You know, sort of thing. I mean, they just couldn't understand that why a capital city should not have a major university, uh, should not have recreational activities, you know, a theater and other things as Washington is. You know, although there are references to New York and uh, and, and to uh, to Washington in all these discussions that take place. Yeah. That is true. Yeah, and one of the other things that Indians were sensitized to very early, uh, right after independence, is the green belt that was built around Chandigarh. Uh, yes, from environmentally, you know, sort of thing. And the same idea was applied to other places as well. The same model was used in uh, renovating older sections of other cities in India and other suburbias that have come up, uh, you know, in and around uh, these cities and, and far and beyond as well have followed pretty much the same, you know, uh, super block model, uh, you know, sort of thing. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much.